What's good, Revive? My name is Freddie, and I am part of the pastoral team here at Revive Church, and it's so good to have you with us today. And if this is your first time watching us or joining us for our online service, we welcome you. Today is uh, Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of every month we, we have communion. So um, as Vanessa said earlier in the service, get your elements ready because at the end of the message, we're all going to participate together in this very sacred moment. Today I get the privilege to continue our Kingdom Come series. And this is a series that has completely, for a lot of us, shifted our perspective. In fact, for some of us, it's just totally like turned it upside down. What was valuable to us, you know, in worldly and earthly terms, is it, it, to heaven, it, it, it's, it's not, it's useless, right? And so we've come to find out what matters to the heart of God, what matters, what's important to him, what the priorities of the kingdom are. And if they are priorities to the kingdom, they are to be priorities to us. And so today... I'd like to share on a very famous parable, a very famous story, and I'd like for you to join me on this journey. As humans, as humans, we have so many different tastes. We have different tastes in music. We have so many differences in, in the kind of things we like, like the food we eat and different tastes in entertainment. That We all have a different favorite movie. We have different tastes in culture and in styles of clothing. Some of us even have a different taste in, in how we worship. Some of us like really loud music. Some of us like, like the old school hymns. Some of us have different tastes in any type of entertainment we consume, the type of books we read, the type of clothes we wear. A lot of people lean differently in their views. Like we have so many differences. But for the majority of us, the majority of human beings, we tend to come together to a consensus on a particular issue. And that issue is the issue of heaven. See, for a lot of us, we think logically. We think of this issue of heaven as, as, as simple. It's, it's black and gray. We believe that good people go to heaven. And if you want to get into heaven, if you get into heaven, you ought to be good. And it has its logic, right? Because it's a fair system. It's a fair system. It makes sense that good people would go to heaven. And we perceive that this is what the Bible teaches. And we perceive that if I'm good, if I, if I do good, if I show my goodness on this earth, God surely will see it and he'll write my name down. And I'll be on the VIP list to get into heaven. And we also think, like we think that, that everyone, everyone ought to want to go to heaven. Therefore, everyone ought to want to do good. But here's a Here's, an, here's the issue with that. Here's the problem with that. And the problem is this. The problem is who decides what's good? Who, who sets the standard of morality and goodness and judges who has done uh, significantly good things and who falls short of that standard? For most of us, we do. It's a personal standard. It's a personal issue. We voluntarily say, I will decide what is good in life and what isn't good. We describe ourselves as good. We tend to be very lenient on ourselves when we judge ourselves, don't we? We tend to present our record. And when we look at each other, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we say, you know what? Even though, even though I have a past or even though I've done a few things, look at my, look at my record, my good things outweigh the bad things that I've done. Therefore, the majority of my actions, since they've been good, I ought to be identified as a good person. And we overwhelmingly are so lenient when it comes to judging ourselves, right? I do that in marriage. Every time I get called out with my wife, what I want to do is present a record of all the good things that I've done so that it would offset this one thing that I didn't do. We're so lenient with ourselves when it comes to judging ourselves, the other proponent of, 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 of judging what is good and what is bad and who gets into heaven and who doesn't is society, is other people, how others describe, on, describe us, sorry. But here, herein lies a common lie that no one likes to admit, and that is that the majority doesn't always get it right. The majority doesn't always get it right. We're quick to to think that, that the majority decides that as humans we can come to a consensus and a collective on these things. And the reality is that it shifts decade to decade, even year to year. 
We think about how, how we slant, you know, the curve of grading ourselves based on what the culture is saying, what the culture is calling good. And, and, and we perceive these things to be accurate, but the reality is because we are flawed human beings, we tend to move the standard, we tend to move the barometer, we tend to move the measurement of what is good and what is bad according to our own desires and our own comfort. And oftentimes we, the church, have allowed the, the, the world, the culture to decide what's good and bad. And, and we can see throughout history that sometimes we don't get it right. We just don't. And it's something that as humans we got to admit we don't get it right. So we have these two groups of people. Right? We have some gray area, but for the most part, we have these two groups of people. We, 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 to, to oversimplify today's sermon, today's message, we'll just call them the good ones and the bad ones. We have these two groups of people, and, and these two groups of people in, 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 this, in the Gospels were always around Jesus. Now, go figure that. The good people were always around Jesus, and the bad people were always around Jesus. He was attractional to both. But the reason both audiences, both groups were attracted to him were because they both had different needs. They both had different measurements of need. And they both were attracted to him. Now, one group of people felt that, 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 that they were the judge, that, that if anybody should attract anyone, it would be them. And these are the religious people. The Bible calls them the Pharisees. These were professional good doers. In fact, they would wake up every day because that was their job. And they would say, you know what? What can I do today to prove how good I am? To prove how righteous I am? To prove how religious I am? And if anybody, and if anybody wanted to attract people to themselves, it was these religious people. It was the good ones of society. Society had put them on a pedestal to represent and exemplify the good morals and the conducts that God had established in the scripture. And these guys had volunteered. They had been hand chosen. They had been hand picked to do that. And so they, they had an issue. They had an issue that, that, you know, another rabbi named Jesus would be attracting crowds. But it wasn't that he was attracting crowds. It was the type of crowds that he was attracting that they had an issue with. And so we find this tension in Luke 15 where Jesus is talking with a group of people who always follow him. Notorious sinners, people of criminal record, people with a huge uh, past that was notoriously bad. And Jesus was talking with them, and here lies the, 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 the setting. The Bible says, by this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and, and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them treating them like old friends. They did not understand how someone who claims to be good could hang out so freely with people that they deemed bad. And so verse 3 says their grumbling triggered this story. In other words, because Jesus knew what they were thinking in their heads and feeling in their hearts, Jesus felt compelled to share this story. Jesus decides to explain how the kingdom of heaven deals with the good people and the bad people, which is attractive to good and bad. And so he, he begins by telling them parables, and parables are known stories to explain an unknown principle. And I want you to understand that the first two parables we're going to quickly see are just a setup. They're a preamble to Jesus' central main idea that he wants to get through to the Pharisees. The first one is about a shepherd. And in verse 4 it says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will, what, will, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. 
Jesus is asking the audience, he's asking the audience if they agree with the events of the parable and the result. He's letting them know, here is a shepherd who loses one sheep and he leaves the 99. Like he leaves the majority to go after the singular sheep that is lost. Now, for the audience, the effort and reaction of this shepherd is justified in their eyes. Why? Because the, sh- the sheep represents future clothing, future food. It is a resource that is valuable to this person, to this shepherd. And so they all agree, they all agree that, that he should leave the 99 and go after the one lost sheep. And when he finds it, he gets his friends and they have a party because they found the lost sheep. And in verse 7 it says, count on it, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in need of no rescue. Their reaction to a story of an animal being found is joy. And what is heaven's reaction? It is joy. So Jesus then proceeds to tell them another story. And this is known as the story of the woman and the lost coin. And he says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Again, Jesus is asking the audience if the events in this parable justify the results justify the actions of the protagonist, in this case, a woman who still has a lot of coins. She has nine coins, but she loses one, turns her house upside down, sweeps the floor, turns on the lights, and is looking for, and she finds it. And of course, both audiences, good and bad, would say, of course, it's money. It's money. We lose our wallets, we lose our keys, and we go crazy, frantically looking for what is lost. And she finds it. And of course, the people on both sides, good and bad, would say, yes, it's justified. I totally agree that she should have looked for her coin. And they are happy with the result. The Bible says in verse 10, Jesus says, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels. With even one sinner repents. And so the reaction of the woman in the story of the protagonist is joy when she finds the lost coin. What is the reaction that Jesus says heaven is having when a lost sinner gets rep- repents? It is joy. And I think that the people in the audience, as they're listening to these stories, they're thinking there might be a horrible ending. But when Jesus concludes the story and says, and the coin was found, I'm assuming in their hearts there was joy because this story had a happy ending. But again, again, Jesus is a master communicator, and he's setting up both groups for something special. He's setting up the good, the religious, the perfect with the bad, the notorious singers, those with a bad history, a bad reputation. And Jesus is setting them both up because he wants to teach a principle of the kingdom. He wants us to understand what he wanted them to understand who first heard these parables. Now Jesus sets them up because he's about to hit a grand slam home run. With this next parable. And we know it famously as the, 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 the parable of the prodigal son. But this parable, if you read it in its context, should either have, should, should have been named the parable of the two lost sons. Or the parable of the good father. He starts this parable with these words. And he said, there was a man who had two sons And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. One day, think about this. One day, uh, the younger son in a Jewish culture where they don't do this, like, like what he's essentially telling his dad is, Dad, I had plans for my life. And you're, you haven't died yet, therefore I can't get the part of the inheritance that, that I need to be able to execute the plans in my life. Now, now check this out. The, the younger son wasn't asking for money for money's sake. For when you read this in context, it is insinuated that the father was well off. He was wealthy. And if the father was well off, and, if, and you read the whole story, when he has a conversation with the older son, his children had access 
to his wealth. What the son is saying is not, he's not necessarily saying, dad, I want money so I can live my life. What he's saying is, dad, I want money so I can be in control of my life. Like, I get your goodness. I get, I, I get that I'm in a mansion. I get that I have servants. I get that I don't go hungry. I get that I'm well clothed. But, Dad, I, I want control over my own life. And he's basically telling his dad, Dad, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And Scripture says that he divided the property between them. In verse 13, it says, A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted everything in wild living. Now, I love that this version says that he wasted everything in wild living. And not just he wasted all his money. Because when you are in wild living and you, and you separate yourself from the Father, you lose more than just resources. You lose your soul. You lose who you are. You lose your essence. You lose your dignity. You lose your freedom in pursuit of what looks like freedom you become enslaved to something you didn't even ask for. And so scripture continues to tell us about this, this time when his money had run out. A great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed pigs. This is important because in Jewish culture, they did not eat pigs because a pig was the most defiled, nastiest animal you could have. It was, it was, it, it, it was unholy to be around pigs, to be around the swine. And, and Jesus in this story puts the younger son in a situation where he's lost what he, what he disrespectfully took away from his father, and he puts him in a situation that is the most abhorrent, it is the most disgusting place where a young Jewish person could be. And he has, he has a job feeding pigs, the most unholy of all animals. And Scripture says not only did he have this job where he had to be around them, but he was so broke he was so broken and so hungry. The Bible says the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Sometimes we, we become all those things we've tolerated. And in his situation, in his, in his environment, he is now attracted to the thing that culturally they despise. And the reason he's attracted to it, the reason he's, he's desiring it, the, 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 the reason it looks now good to him is because he's empty. He doesn't have his essence. He doesn't have his soul. He doesn't have his identity. You see, this was a, 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 a young man who had servants. This is a young man who had the covering of his father. This is a young man who didn't have to worry what was for breakfast and lunch the day of tomorrow, he didn't, he didn't have to worry about if bills were going to get paid. He had a different identity in his father's house. But now, but now, he doesn't even know who he is. For he is now desiring to eat what he was feeding these pigs. Now, both sides, both sides could, could feel, I, I assume that the, both sides could look at each other and feel the contempt you know, that, that, the, good, that the, the, the good religious side who was listening to the story he had for this young man in this story, I'm sure they could agree that if the story ended here, it was a good story. And it was a story to warn us not to leave the father's house, not to leave the father's presence. And they could agree on this because when the, when the son asked for his inheritance, what he was saying was, I'm leaving my upbringing. I'm leaving my traditions. I'm forfeiting the covering of the father. I'm turning my back on what I know is good to have control over my life. And anyone, anyone in this culture would say, it is a horrible thing to disrespect a good father in that manner. To say, Dad, I, don't, I, I wish you were dead already, so give me what is mine. And I'm sure that both sides could agree, well, he's wanting to eat the food that belongs to pigs. He deserves it. He deserves it. He has no one to blame but himself. Because the dad gave him all the money that belonged to him, and he wasted it. He deserves it. 
He deserves to be in that position. He deserves the result that he's getting. He deserves to suffer in the way he's suffering for leaving the security of his home and the presence of his father. And so both sides are judging the character in the story, saying, yeah, that makes sense. Jesus is trying to warn us right now. He's trying to make sure that we stay in the house. But Jesus continues with this presentation. The story doesn't end there. At the beginning of the second scene, we have a, a, a come to Jesus moment in a way that the, son, that the younger son has. And the scripture says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. The youngest son recognizes that he has been bad. And so he decides to return back to his father's house. And what, what, make, what causes him to decide these things is that he remembers. He says, look, I'm desiring the pig's food. But in my father's house, even the servants are eating better than I'm eating. And so he thinks to himself, I'm going to go back to my father and, and, and ask him if I could be there because this, this is what he says. This is what he says. He says, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. See, he knew that his disrespect was also a divine sin. And he says, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. What he's saying is this, Dad. This is the speech that he's prepared. Dad, I sinned against you. I disrespected you. I forfeited everything you've ever done for me and who you are to me in pursuit of controlling my own life. And now I know that because I disrespected you in this way, I don't deserve to be your son. And now that I come home empty-handed, there is a debt to be paid. So make me one of your servants. Let me work. Let me, let me work so I can eat. Let me, let me work so I can pay back the debt because I owe you. I sinned against you. I left you. I forfeited my right to be a son. I'm sorry. Just take me in. Even if you make me a slave, take me in. Even if you make me a servant, take me in. Even if you, if you don't call me son ever again, just, just take me in. And he's rehearsing. This speech in scripture says, so he returned home to his father. And I imagine that as he's walking on this journey, while he's on this trek back to his father's house, he's just reciting this monologue. As soon as I see him, I won't, I won't cry. As soon as I see him, I won't, I, I, I won't disrespect him. As soon as I see him, I'm going to beg him. I'm going to let him know how remorseful I am. I'm going to let him know how sorry I am. I'm going to let him know how, how life outside of his home wasn't worth le leaving. I'm going to let him know because, because he felt convicted. He must have smelled like pigs. He must have been in rags. He must have, he must have not had any more shoes he must have been hungry. He must have been hurting. He must have been sick. And with every step, he's reciting his monologue to apologize to his father in hopes that his father would take him in at least as a slave or a servant. And so Jesus, Jesus shows us. Jesus shows us with the parable of the, of the, of the shepherd and, 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 and the woman with the lost coin that it was them who initiated the search but in this parable, in this story, it is the thing that was lost, the person, the character that was lost, the object that was lost, the one that comes to its senses and returns to its rightful owner. And so, and so everyone's saying, well, you know what? If he goes back and the father shows him mercy, he'll make him a servant. If the son goes back and he apologizes and, and there's remorse in his heart, his dad will make him a slave. That might be fair. So Jesus now presents the father's reaction. Scripture says in verse 20, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. 
Notice that the father was already outside looking for him. Many times as a child, I heard this scripture and I heard this sermon and I heard it as, as every morning the dad would go outside with his coffee, hoping that this would be the day his son returns. He was, he was hoping, not expecting, but hoping that his son would return and his father saw him from a long way off and his father saw him with a look of forgiveness. He, looked, he had compassion and love for his son. The father was not moved, not moved that, that the younger son came with twice the wealth that he was given. He wasn't moved that his son came, came with, a, with his fiance and said, Dad, look, this is who I want to marry. Would you bless us? His, his father wasn't moved because the son didn't have anything to offer except his remorse. And so the Bible says that when his father saw him coming, he was filled with loving compassion and he ran to his son. He embraced his son and he kissed him. Could it be that while we in our sin don't feel like we're worthy enough to come back to Jesus, to come back to God, God is actually waiting for us to take that initiative. But it's not an initiative that, that, that it's like, well, if he doesn't talk to me, I won't talk to God is yearning for relationship with his children. And in verse 21, in verse 21 Scripture says, and the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So here he starts his monologue, his rehearsed speech. And he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. In other words, the father did not wait for the son to finish his monologue. For we know how it ends. He practiced it. He rehearsed it in front of the pigs. But the father cuts him off. He's not trying to hear his begging. He's not trying to hear the apology. The fact that you came back home is enough, and I want to restore you. And he tells his servants, bring the best robe. Clothe him once again and put it on him. Put on the family ring on him. I'm going to restore him. And he says, and put shoes on his feet. I am going to cover him. And the servants of the house helped to restore the son He's, he, they helped to restore the son back to the status the son had before. He forfeited and disrespected his dad on his way out. Because to the culture's eye, to society's eye, he wasn't worthy to be called the son. But in his dad's heart, that boy, that young man, never stopped being part of the family. And so the dad says, and bring the fattened calf the one we've been saving for a celebration, the one we've been saving for a wedding, the one we've been saving when, 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 when we're going to celebrate something good, when we're going to feast. He says, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. They began to say, like this was worthy of celebration. Now, almost everybody focuses on this beautiful story. They focus on this part. And most people, most people, when they, we tend to share this parable, we share it sentimentally, we share it emotionally. And we almost imagine that the people listening to Jesus and listening to the story were listening with, with tears in their eyes. Oh, my goodness. How sweet. But the reality is that if you read this in context, if you read who the audience was that Jesus was sharing the story to, they didn't have tears. They were offended. They were shocked. They were flabbergasted that this would be the reaction of the father. What? Clothe them, take them back, not to make them pay for everything he wasted. What? This vile son, this evil son who left the house, they, they were just shocked. That everything they thought about coming to God, everything they taught about coming to God was completely wrong. So far in this story, we tend to think that the youngest son is the focus of the story, and it isn't. Because another character enters the story. One, did we not, one that, that we did not expect. Another son who has a, a, a distant, a, a very different character, but was just as lost. In verses 25 to 27, he says, Now his older son was in the field, and when he came, as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe 
and sound. See, the elder brother, the Bible says, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. That his father had to come out and beg them to come in. The older brother is showing, is showing us right now. He's exposing himself as to what he cares most about. And he replied, the older brother replies, all these years I've slaved for you. Think about this. I've slaved for you? What kind of language is that of a son who is wealthy because of his father? And never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. The, the oldest son was flabbergasted that they would take the fattened calf, the one they were saving for a, celeb a, a, celebrate, a celebratory event. He's offended that they would give him the best robe in the house. He's offended that, that, that they put a ring on his finger. And remember, the inheritance that was given to the youngest son is, is gone. It's squandered. It's, 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 it's forever gone. And whatever we're giving the younger son now in his restoration is probably coming out of the account of the older son. You see... Grace and forgiveness is always free to the perpetrator, but it's always costly to the one giving mercy, offering the grace. Someone's got to pay for it. And true grace, true mercy never charges the one who committed the infraction. And so here the oldest son has an opportunity to embrace what his father is embracing, but he misses it. And his, but he answered his father and he said, look, man, I've been slaving for you and, dis and I've never disobeyed. And you've never given me something. See, notice that he doesn't say my brother. But he says, he says this son of yours. He's trying to separate from the family. And apparently this oldest son knew what his, what his younger brother was up to this whole time. But he never went out to rescue him. The older brother could have gone out to save his brother. He could have taken his share of the resources to restore his brother. But he didn't. He stayed home. But not to be with the father. See, the oldest son also shows us that he didn't want to be with the father. He just wanted the father's things. He, he was jealous that his younger brother was given things. Because those are the things that he aspired to have for himself. He wanted his father's blessings. He wasn't all these years in his father's house obeying and serving him because he loved his father. He was doing it to get something out of his father. You see, the youngest son blatantly tells his father, I don't want you, I want your things, and left. The older brother symbolically tells his father, I don't want you. I want your things. And he stayed. They both were lost. They both did not yearn a relationship with their father because the wealth of the father obscured the opportunity and privilege and honor that they could have had. Now, finally, the good ones who, 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 who like are listening to this, all the religious people, I assume that they said, yes, of course the older son is going to be angry. Of course the older son is going to have a problem. Why? Because this isn't fair. And they, and they identified with the oldest son. And so here's the response of the kingdom. Here's the response of the father. He says, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. The father responds with what he values more than obedience by saying, you are always with me. And as a consequence, everything I have is yours. It has always been, even before you've even asked me for something. See, what he's saying to his, the older brother is this. Look, I, I don't value the things your, 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 your brother lost. I value his presence. I value him. And look, your obedience doesn't give you access to my things. It is your relationship to me that gives you access to my blessings, that gives you access to my wealth, that gives you access to the things that I own. And because we are in relationship, we are in covenant, they belong to you. 
And son, I would forfeit. I would, I would kill a million fattened calves. I would kill, I, I would put a thousand rings on your brother. I would, I would clothe him with the best clothing forevermore as long as he's in the house. And he, tells, and he tells the older brother, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. The father was not hurt by the fortune that the younger son had lost. It hurt him that his youngest son wasn't with him. And in this moment, it wasn't hurting the father that, that the oldest son uh, 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 was angry. What, it, what was hurting him was that he wasn't a part of the celebration and he was refusing to come in. The father reminds him and lets him know all I want is to be together with you. And so the father leaves the greatest party ever thrown in this village to come outside to bring the older brother inside because he was lost as well. Now, in this story, unlike the first two, there is no resolution. There is no closure. It's a cliffhanger. It ends then and there. Unlike the story of the lost sheep or the lost coin, this doesn't necessarily have a happy ender. The younger brother is being celebrated and is being honored for what? For just coming home? But that's the kingdom. And the parable is used by Jesus to inform the wicked that the, the kingdom loves them so much. That the father yearns to be with them to an extent that he would send his only son to die for them. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we, were, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But Jesus doesn't end the story because reality, I think he looks at the Pharisees and the religious people and he's looking at us today. And he's telling us, you decide how this story ends. You decide if you're going to embrace your brother who's come home, if you're going to allow us to be unfair and honor those in ways they do not deserve, you decide if we're going to go out and look for the lost. You decide if we're going to embrace the values of the kingdom and, 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 and offer grace and mercy and forgiveness and make this a welcoming home. You decide that if that 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 we will that, that that you will love those you disagree with. You decide if those that you think are evil and unworthy of heaven are more than worthy of the love of Jesus Christ. You decide, and that is a decision we have to make as part of the kingdom. We decide: Are we going to celebrate? See in the parables. The problem's not in heaven. In, in heaven, they rejoice when one sinner repents. In heaven, they throw the greatest parties when someone comes back home. The issue is, what's happening on earth? Are we celebrating that the lost and the blind now see and the dead are now coming to life? And are we offering this hope and this grace and this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others? Here's what I... I'll leave you with, if you've gone astray and you feel that you've lost your way, God is waiting for you to return home. And he offers us, he offers us the forgiveness of our sins. And there is no debt to be paid because he paid the debt for your sin on that rugged cross. And the second thing, for those of us that have stayed in the house, have we stayed because we just need his hope, his grace, his love, his blessings, or are we truly staying because we want to be in covenant relationship with him? On the bottom of your screen, you see different ways to connect with our church. And we want to pray with you. We want to connect with you. And we want to make sure to let you know that everyone is welcomed here, that there is a place for you in his house. If this is your first time listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're like, you know what? I want to have a relationship with the Father. We're about to take communion right now. And you're like, I want to have a relationship with the Father. I'd love to lead you in a prayer. I'd love for you to repeat these words after me. And again, I always say that it's not the prayer that saves you, but the faith behind the words that you pray and who we're praying to that saves you. And I want you just to boldly say, Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I thank you that you paid my debt for me on that cross. I give you my life. 
be the Lord and Savior of my soul. Thank you for blessing me and welcoming, in, welcoming me into your kingdom. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please connect with us. Again, the information is on the bottom of the screen. You can connect with us. We would love to connect with you. And now as we participate in communion, I want us to recognize the importance of, of this sacred ritual that we do. In Scripture, Jesus, when he, when he has his last supper with his disciples, he tells them, do this in remembrance of me. And what a story. What a story to to set up the communion moment that we're about to have where Jesus offers himself up for our sins. And he says, and he says, and he gives, and he, he, his Bible says that he shares the bread and he says, this is my body that will be crushed for you. When you eat this, remember my body that was crushed for you. Let us all take the bread. And then Jesus shares the wine with his disciples. And he says, this is my blood. This represents my blood. That will wash away all your sins. And as we drink this, I want you to drink this with gratitude and say, Lord, thank you for the shedding of your blood that has washed away my sins. Lord, I ask you to bless every person that's watched this. And I want every person, Father God, to experience being in relationship with you. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Amen. God bless you, Revive. Shall pierce 
the line And I will rise among the saints My case transfixed on Jesus' face Let's sing that one more time He shall return in robes of white The blazing sun shall pierce the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name forevermore For endless days we will sing Your praise Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God We'll sing Your praise the name Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name forevermore For endless days we will sing Your praise Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God You're the name above all names You are worthy of my praise And my heart will sing how great is our God You're the name above all names God passionately pursues the lost through us and that is so exciting and hey if you feel lost or you feel disconnected or you feel like you just need to be plugged in well we got you email us there's information on the bottom of the screen and let us know how we can come alongside you in this season we love you revive family uh -huh.